Okay, again, I'm Rod Beckstrom. Um, lucky to now be the CEO of ICANN and thrilled to be here with all of you today. And we're going to talk a little bit about the economics of networks and how those apply to, apply to different network models. Because obviously we're dealing with networks all the time. We need to understand the physics of networks. We understand the protocol. We need to understand the protocols of networks, okay, which a lot of you do work on and others do work on. We need to understand security, but we also need to understand the economics. So, because if we don't understand the economics, how are we going to understand the drivers for the business and how are we going to understand the drivers for security? So that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, first, I'll talk just a little bit about ICANN. So, uh, how many of you have heard of ICANN, by the way? All right, you're a tech-savvy crowd, so, you know, most, most everyone here, well, most people on Earth have not heard of ICANN, and certainly most people that use the Internet have not heard of ICANN, and they don't really need to because it's a service function that runs in the background uh, as part of the ecosystem of the nonprofit parties that are helping to keep the internet working. And specifically, what ICANN does is ICANN addresses the internet. And that means that, so right, when we go to a city like Las Vegas, okay, most of us don't use phone books anymore, but 10 years ago we would have, right? So if we go to use a phone book, Phone book's got two primary things that you can say maybe three. It's got names, it's got addresses, okay, it's got phone numbers. Okay, in the internet, there's two sets of addresses that really matter, or unique identifiers. Hi, Bob, good morning. Um, those, and those are the names like John Smith, okay, except in the internet, right, it's trendmicro.com or semantic.com or usaf.gov or .mil, excuse me. Um, so, in the internet, we've got a unique set of names and a unique set of numbers. Now, what's the key difference in addressing the internet versus addressing the phone system? What's the, what's the key difference? If we look at the phone numbers, are they, are they kind of similar in how we handle them? Yeah, they kind of are. In fact, it's interesting. Even phone numbers come kind of in four number blocks, right? Country code, area code usually a two or three digit prefix and the rest of the number. And, and telephone numbers are unique, okay? There's been a system set up by all the telephone companies in the world so that every telephone number is unique. So that if I call your number, you know, plus nine one three six five eight five two four five one, it only goes to your phone. But are the, are the name, what about the names in the phone book? Are the names in the phone book unique? Are they unique? No, I mean, is there only one John Smith in the phone book? No, there's a lot of John Smiths in the phone book. Okay, the difference in the Internet is, in the Internet, every name has to be unique. Otherwise, if someone sent email to noah.kagan at usaf.mil, I know that's not your last name, I'm protecting you here for all the online viewers. Um, <clears throat> If, if the names weren't unique, the emails wouldn't get to the right destination, or you wouldn't get to the web page that you want to have. So in the internet, every single name has to be unique. Therefore, there has to be policies. There has to be policies, and there has to be this kind of decentralized set of parties of who runs .com, and who runs .net, and who runs .se for Sweden, and who runs uh, uh, .jp for Japan. ICANN is the organization that administers all those policies and administers the systems to ensure the uniqueness of all names and the uniqueness of all addresses. And how many of you have, have had conflicts with addresses or names leading you to some place you didn't think it was going to be? Right? The, only, the, the conflicts that come up usually is someone's ripped off a name or you've done a typo and they've tried to hijack you. But the reality is the, the, the system has worked incredibly well for three decades now. And there's 200 million names in the system and there's over a billion network addresses that have been allocated. And with IPv6, there'll be trillions of trillions of addresses. So ICANN is a group that does that. It's a nonprofit organization. Now, ICANN doesn't do that alone. I mean, it, it performs those functions. But what makes the Internet work? I mean, who, who is to say what a URL is and how a URL should work? Well, the IETF does that, the Internet Engineering Task Force that was started, uh, you know, long time ago uh, and has been run by the great geniuses. Many of you, how many of you have been involved with the IETF? 
Okay, so you know because you've been involved. So the ITF sets up all the protocols, all the standards, and ICANN's only job is to implement those as they relate to names and addresses, and so-called the DNS system, the domain name system. The Internet Society is also very involved in all of this because the Internet Society supports the IETF. They have a contract with ICANN to run what's called .org. That gives them money. The, they use their profits, as it were. They're a nonprofit. They use their excess to fund IETF's work on the protocols. And IETF is the single organization that has set up all these protocols, these wondrous protocols that we use uh, to, to keep the Internet running. And it's an incredible bottoms-up stakeholder engineering-led organization. Uh, we at ICANN, we have thousands and thousands of people involved in our stakeholder groups, from the, uh, a new consumer group that's coming together, to an at-large group, to the registrars, to the registries, to the countries, because we have to have contracts with every country in the world to enforce that consistency in names and numbers. So that's what ICANN. ICANN is basically like the global telephone you know, uh, number and naming system uh, uh, policy group for the internet, and it has database and, and, and technology that, that help uh, to administer those pieces. So that's what ICANN does, and it's nonprofit, and I'm really thrilled to be there. I've worked, I've given about 80% 80, 80 of my time to nonprofits over the last 10 years as a volunteer, and this is the first time in my life I've been hired by a nonprofit to work full time and serve it as president and CEO. So I really appreciate the support from all of you and from those that, that elected me from those stakeholder groups. So that's ICANN. So let's talk about network economics. First question is, you know, why does it matter? You know, why, why, why is it important to understand economics? Well, obviously economics are important because usually we pick up the newspaper these days, right, and we're looking at the TARP funds and the bailouts, and it's really a lot of what we read on the front page of the papers is about economics and what's going on in the economy, what's going on in business. So what's going on with networks and networks economics? And that's what we're going to talk about today. And, and some of the things that we can look at answering are questions like, how valuable is a network to one user? I mean, what's it worth to you? What's a network worth to you? Whether that's a social network, whether that's a golf club that you're in, or whether that's your Twitter network, or whether that's your technology network or your company, your business model. So what's the, what's the value to a user? And what's the value of total networks? How do you look at total network value? What are security economics? And actually, the way I got into this field was when I was hired to be the director of the National Cybersecurity Center, I wanted to do some risk management. I thought, we're, we're, you know, we, the federal government, US government, was looking at spending billions and billions of dollars on cybersecurity. And as someone with a tech background and a risk management background, my question was, you know, what's the payoff? I mean, how much should we spend? And where should those billions go? And do we actually have an objective framework, or are we just throwing billions at different projects because we think they sound good? Which isn't a very, isn't a very compelling logic, right? So if you're going to do risk management, you've got to figure out what function you're going to maximize or minimize. You know, what are you optimizing? And what I discovered very quickly was we didn't know. It was not defined what we were maximizing or minimizing. And in that context, you're not going to do optimal risk management. You're going to fiddle around. You're going to do projects. And uh, so that, that led to this line of inquiry. So we're going to look at security economics and then security risk management. We're going to look at hacker economics. Because if we want to deal with hacking, right, and, and look at changing what's going on in the world of hacking, probably wouldn't hurt to understand the economic standpoint of a hacker, okay? Uh, and, and if we understand the, the, the hacker's economics, well, then maybe we can understand deterrence and have an economic model for deterrence. Um, we can also look at many different problems, whether it's supply chain problem. How many people are familiar with the supply chain problem? Okay. All right, so I'll define what the supply chain problem is about is that the most efficient way to hack, in part, is to put your, your code, your malicious code, into the device drivers or directly into silicon or in the software or the products that get shipped, whether it's a PC or a hard disk or a USB. If you can put your malicious code into that device as it's manufactured, you get free distribution. You know, and then the customers accept it, believe they're getting something clean, and then all of a sudden, they're beaconing back to somewhere else and inviting all kinds of, of nasties into your network and into their machine. So that's, that's called the supply chain problem, and it is a very serious issue. Um, so maybe we'll understand the incentives 
of that industry and what can be done to deter bad activity in supply chain. We also want to look at economics of internet protocols themselves, because at the end of the, day, end of the day, what is the internet, really? You know, the internet is a set of now hundreds of millions or billions of interconnected devices that are connected through what? Protocols. The devices are owned by all these different human beings and organizations. The protocols are shared by everyone and are what connect us. Uh, so what are the economics of those protocols? What are the economics of outages, economics of resiliency? So these are a set of issues, you know, I think that affect all of our, they affect business, they affect government, they can affect us as individuals. So that's, that's why I think the economics matters. And it's been sort of, uh, some people call economics a dismal science. Um, I think in the case of network economics, it's called an ignored science. It has not been well developed, okay? So what we're going to look at today is, is possibly a new model that can help. So let's go to the, the, the historic default model that people have talked about. And how many people have heard of Metcalf's Law, by the way, you know, or Bob Metcalf? So Bob Metcalf is a brilliant guy, and he was at, I think he was at Xerox, Xerox Park, wasn't he, when he invented Ethernet, okay, or co-invented Ethernet, okay, brilliant guy. And, um, but he was at a conference back in the early 80s, and he proposed, and this is proposed that the value of a network was proportional to the square of the number of nodes on the network or the number of users. So that means basically the value of a network is equal to n squared times p, where n is the number of nodes or endpoints and p is some magical constant that I'm not sure how we're supposed to figure it out, but it, there's, a, there's a proportional constant there. Now, does anyone remember what network Metcalf used as an example to justify this, this, this model? Exactly. Thank you. Fax machine. And what did he tell us about the fax network? Okay, what he, what he told us was the more faxes come online, then the, grow, the network just keeps growing in value, right? So it's just, and it's geometric. Obviously, look at that model. It's geometric. So it's just, you know, total, you know, hockey stick up to the, to the right. And he said, look, it looks like it's true. You know, in the 1980s, it did look like it was true. Because, you know, I, I mean, probably almost all of us have a fax machine in our home now, and our computers have fax capabilities. But 30 years ago, very few people did, okay? I mean, when, when faxes were first started, you know, those modems were like the size of refrigerators. They were enormous. So what Metcalf said was, look, this fax network keeps spreading, and the more it spreads, the more people plug in, the more valuable it is, right? Sounds good. And he used that as a justification for this. Now, how many of you would like to buy into a network based on using Metcalf's law? How many of you would actually value the network and pay a price to buy into that network with Metcalf's law? Do I have any takers? Well, let me tell you something. The investment bankers found lots of them in the late 1990s. Okay, in the late 1990s, part of the argument was, well, these companies are worth so much money because whoever gets into each market first is going to have a geometric progression in value because of the network effect. And this network effect is going to make them worth so much money that we should value startups that have no revenues and are losing a lot of money but gaining millions of customers, they should be worth $5 billion, 10, 20, 30 billion dollars in some cases up to near $100 billion. And then, of course, what happened? Okay? Pew, pew, just crashed. So that bubble went for a while as long as people believed in this kind of fictitious model, and it collapsed. Because I'll use the fax network today to prove that Metcalf's model is wrong. Of course, it's not really a law anyway. Okay? And, no, and no one has used this model to actually solve a networking problem. What it really talks about is it's related to the number of possible connections in a network. n times n minus 1, all divided by 2, equals the number of total possible connections among us in the room or inside of any network. So, but who cares about the number of possible connections? You're probably not going to send a fax to every single person on Earth, are you? Okay, so not all those new users in Africa or Russia or Middle East are probably valuable to you. Okay? The, the, the reality is you care about the subset that you care about. Now, some people realize, okay, so, and today, look at, the, look at the fax network today. The fax network today 
is bigger than it has ever been in history, right? Because the fax machines are so cheap, you can buy them for 20 or 30 bucks if you want to. And most PCs now have fax capabilities and computers that are plugged into the internet. Now, is the fax network worth more today than it was 15 years ago, or would you say it's worth less? Right. And why is it worth less? Because the internet, and what do we do with the internet that we, could, we didn't do with the fax machines? I'm sorry? Exactly. We communicate more. We send emails instead of faxes. We send PDFs, documents instead of faxes. We send Word documents. And FedEx and UPS have gotten better too, right? So substitutes, so even though the fax network, if, if, if Metcalf's model was right, the fax network would be worth more every single day. Instead, it's dropping in value because we're using substitute goods and services, okay? So it shows that this is not... This is, this is not really an economic model we can use. Or if we do, I have some stock I'd like to share to sell you. Okay? Um, now then others came along and they tuned Metcalf's law. You know, so like Zipf came along and he said, you know, well, the problem with Metcalf's law is it says it's geometric forever, and in reality I think it's geometric for a while, and then it tapers off, and then it drops down. And other people said, well, it doesn't really grow completely geometrically, it's more like a log fu function, and they put a log function number in there. And then Reed at Harvard came along and Reed said, well, you know, what's really important is the number of possible subsets you could put in a, in a group in the internet. So if there's 200 of us in the room, how many po possible subsets are there? You know, and because there's 200, you gotta do some math, you figure out the number of all the potential subsets of how we could group from, you know, me and Tamsin and, and Rich to, to Sally, Bob, and Bill, and Larry, and Rich, and, and Sam, and guess what? That's irrelevant too. I mean, who cares about how many, how many subsets you could have, right? That's like, that's like saying, you know, how valuable are your Twitter followers, right? If you just auto-follow everybody and they auto-follow you, I mean, what does it really matter? So the, there's a key problem that all of these models have, okay? And the problem can be summed up as this, and that is it's just not about N. The value of a network is not about the number of nodes on the network. So what's T and what's it really about? What do we do on networks that matters? We do transactions, okay? We want to get something done, whether it's sending an email or doing a search or sending a packet or sending a file or integrating a supply chain. What we do are transactions. So all the economic models that focused on valuation based on numbers will never come up with a real economic value, is, is what I posit, is my proposal to you. So today what we're going to look at is a new model, a very simple fundamental model that's based on T, namely transactions. So let's step through that. Okay, and another way to look at this, by the way, and some of you may have known you know, me for, for having uh, uh, been a co-author of the book The Starfish and the Spider. And the thesis of that book, right, was that spiders are centralized, centralized creatures. You can cut off a leg, they're just crippled seven-legged creatures, but if you cut off the head, they die. Why do they die? Because they're centralized. This N model was a centralized model because it looked at a whole network and it said all that matters is how big it is, and if you, if you know how big it is, you know how valuable it is. So it was a very centralized approach. The T model is a lot more like a starfish. So starfish are decentralized. They have between four and 50 arms. And if you cut an arm off, they can regenerate. And in some species, like the one pictured here, if you cut all five arms of the starfish off, you can get five new starfish. Each one can create a new living creature because they are decentralized. And when we look at transactions, we don't even really care that much how many nodes there are. Who cares how many faxes there are, how many PCs there are? You may have a PC in your house used by 12 people you know, or by two people. Or maybe an internet cafe near a slum in Africa like Kibera, and you may literally have 500 people a week cycle through and use a PC. So it's not about in at all. So a decentralized approach is to look at transactions and look at them from the endpoint of the users out there. And who cares about how many devices they are? there are? It just doesn't matter. So we're going to look at T, not N. And if there's anything you take away from day, today, that's just it, is that if you're going to look at the value of a network, focus on the transactions. But now let's get a little more fine-grained in looking at how we look at those transactions and build a law. So Metcalf, you know, someone called that Metcalf's law, and someone, when I presented this, said, well, that's Beckstrom's law. You should really call it a law. So we'll see. Um, this is the law in words, and it's this simple. 
but there's a lot of work to get done to get the real data, and that is the value of a network is equal to the net value added to each user's transactions summed for all users. That is the equation. Now, there's a couple of key things about this model. One is that we're looking at transactions. Another is that we're looking at it from the edge of the network. We're looking at it from Noah's perspective as a user looking into that network. We're not looking at it from the middle of the network out. We're looking at it from your grandmother's, your mother's use of the network. You know, like my mom uses AOL still, okay? She uses AOL. Uh, uh, I'm sure Tim would be happy. Um, so what's the value from her? So we're going to look at it from the user standpoint. Now, what's a user? Who should, who should we count as a user of the network? What kind of entities? Should it just be people? No, it can't just be people. People use the internet and they derive personal value, but our companies uses it, use it, right? Symantec uses it, Trend Micro, every security firm here uses it, IDG uses it. So we're going to have to look, a user is any entity that does transactions. So if you do transactions, you're contracting for transactions, whether you're a church, a synagogue, a for-profit business, a non-profit, a government agency, a cult, a group of hackers, a group of a network defenders, if you are an entity, you're a user. Okay? So very broad-based model. And then we're going to sum that up for all users. Well, let's look at it. What does it mean mathematically? And I know there's a lot of really good math. How many, how many of you studied engineering or math or has ever done computer programming or network management? Okay, highly quantitative off, off, uh, audience. Good, because we're going to go through some quantitative stuff today to give you some real tools and to show you some real math behind this. So let's look at the question of a user. Well, what's your name there in the brown shirt with the nice hat? Richard. So we're going to look at the value of the network from Richard's standpoint, if we may. Okay? So Richard is here is I equals Richard, basically, individual Richard, and J, VI sub J is, it's Richard looking at the internet, internet's J, because Richard's actually a member of, uses many different networks, he probably uses the telephone network, you're probably a member of some clubs and groups. We're just going to look at your relationship with the internet, if that's okay, Richard. Okay, so the value of the internet to Richard is simply the summation function, sigma, summation of the benefit of all transactions that Richard does on the internet over a year minus the summation of all the costs. So sigma b minus sigma c. So if we can just figure out how many transactions Richard does, and maybe we'll walk through some samples here, then we're going to get an idea of what it's worth to him. So Richard, I assume you buy some books online? About how many do you buy a year? 10 or 20 online. Will you buy them in Amazon, Borders, or where do you go? All the above. You look for price? Yeah. You are the ultimate economic animal. Okay, so 20 books a year. Richard, would it, would it be fair to say that you save about 10 bucks a book on average versus going to the bookstore or more? Yeah. Okay, so we're going to say, so Richard, I'm going to say you're going to buy a hardback book here and that it would cost you about $26 in this example. Okay, One, a hardback book, let's say it costs $26 at the bookstore with your gas, with your tax. Now, if you go online, I'm going to say in this example, you could buy the same book for 16 bucks. So you probably use a price shopping engine, right? Which one do you use? Uh, Google's. Google's. Noah, can we get him the mic, by the way? That'd be really great. So you use Google's price shopping engine. Is that fr do, you, uh, do, you, do you use Frugal? Yes. Use Frugal. OK, so Rich is going to buy a book for 26 bucks. He, he would, it would cost him 26 in the bookstore. He really wants the book. You get it for 16 online, so you save $10, right? And then you said you bought how many a year? 10 or 20. So I'm going to take 20 for a second, just for math. So if Richard buys 20 bucks a year, and you save 10 bucks a book, you're saving how much? 200 bucks a year. But you have a cost of being connected to the internet, right? So how much do you pay for your monthly connectivity? OK. So you pay 40 bucks a month, so you're spending $480 a year to be connected. So your books just contributed $200 in value. But we're going to go look, like, do you use Skype? Rich, is that mic on? Can, can we turn up the volume of the mic, please, guys? Thank you. Oh, on the bottom of the mic, there's a little knob. I think it was already on, wasn't it? It's on. 
it may be muted in your system or okay you can come check it sir thank you so anyway so rich saves about two hundred dollars on those books but rich probably does google searches or yahoo searches there we, go. there we go or bing search all right there we go now we're connected so which search engine do you use rich uh frugal Rickard, richard richard uh, and you use go how many times a month do you think you use it uh, I price shop ahead of time, so probably a couple times a week. Okay, so and that's just on that's just on on price shopping, but you use it for a lot of other research and things, don't you? Google, you would use or or Yahoo or Bing or whatever, right? You use for different things. Yeah. So the point is, for Richard, we got to look at all his transactions, book purchases, searches. Do you do you do Skype calls? Not much. Not, not much. Yet. Okay. Um, but what what are the other main transactions you do on using the internet? Would you say you do emails, right? Yep. What else do you tend to do? Read news articles. Read news articles. Okay, IDG is really, really, really glad to hear that, and so are the other journalists here. How many journalists do we have here, by the way? Okay, good. All right. So anyway, so for Richard, that, we're going to figure out what it's worth, okay, by looking at all his transactions minus all his costs. That gives us a basic economic model of how much the Internet is worth to you during a year, right? And obviously, I think it must be worth more than $480, or you wouldn't pay for connectivity, correct? Right. Right. So we also get to look at, there's a lot of boundary conditions that can help us start getting our head around the problem. Because if it wasn't worth $480 a year, it wasn't worth $40 a month, you just he, he quit paying for it. So now let's look at the value of the internet. So we're going to quickly jump from you to the billion and a half human beings and probably 100 million organizations plus that use the internet. And Vince Cerf actually helped me with this notation yesterday, because I didn't have V in, print, in, in brackets of J, which is another nice way to, to express it. We're going to look at the total value of the Internet, which is, happens to be network J in this case, or J equals 1. And to do that, we're going to look at the summation for all Richards, okay? So sigma VIJ. So we've just changed the equation, which is the summation then of all the B and C functions. So in other words, look at that methodology. If you can estimate the value of the internet to each one of your customers or a network to each of your customers from their standpoint, because again, we're doing it from his standpoint, not mine, not yours, not some universal constant. We're looking in from the edge of the network. Sum it up, we get the value. To really do the Greeks, this is the, this is the full Greeks, and this is the full model. And it, it's really quite simple especially for most, most of you that are mathematicians. Um, so what this model says is we're, look, we're gonna look at um, uh, one network J, so we're not doing sigma J's here, we're just gonna do one network, so VI sub J, summarize I equals one to N, where N is, is what? It's the number of users, right? And that means humans or, and all organizations. It means actually anything that does transactions over the internet. And that'll get into some interesting philosophical questions some days. You know, what about some entities that do transactions that aren't really owned by anyone? Are they virtual entities? And how do you account for them? How do you sum it up? But so now we got the universe there. Now the next function is the benefit function. So B sub I sub K. So these are the benefit, the value of the transactions to Richard and everyone else. Uh, and the benefits, we're going to use K as a counter up to M. Now why are we counting the benefit? transactions separately from the cost transactions. Anyone have an idea? Why, why do we have separate? Because I got a K counter up there and I got an L counter. Okay, yes sir. Please. Because some transactions are going to have widely differing differentials between those two. Yes, exactly. Right, like your ISP service you pay for usually how often? Once a month, yeah. Once a month, usually, well, right? Well, Most of our, benefit all almost all of our contracts. But how often do you go and search or send an email? Right. Daily. So there's not a match. That, so you get a lot of benefits that are off free transactions that have no cost. So the cost transactions are not the same as the benefit. In, in the case of the book, right, we had a pairing here. You know, we had a cost transaction of 16 bucks, you know, and then a book comes through the mail, and Richard's got that. But, but we go on every day, and we search. So that's why the canners are separate. I have a question. Sure. So... Think about, for example, uh, a Skype call or an instant messaging or something like that. And um, so the benefit, I think I may have just answered my own question in my head, but it seems to me that the cost of that transaction, here's the real question, to whom is the cost reflected? Is it the cost to the person who's actually making the transaction or is it the cost to, let's say, the ISP of carrying the traffic? Yeah. even though that's already been covered by the person who's 
the user has done a transaction? The answer is both. I mean, in many cases, you're going to do a transaction that's free to you. It's going to cost somebody else, right? If some packets are flying around, someone's paying for bandwidth. We're going to look at it from each user's standpoint. So we're going to look at both from your standpoint. So let's, let's look at a Skype call really quickly. This is a good example. So you do a Skype call to me, and let's, let's assume that we do it computer-based so there's no Skype out. We're not paying a local telephone company. So you and I pay nothing, but we get a lot of value because we get to communicate and we're not paying five or ten cents a minute or whatever it might be or buying more minutes, okay? So the cost to us is zero. The benefit is, let's say we have a 20-minute call and it would cost us five cents per minute on another platform. We just saved a dollar each, okay? Or the originator. I saved a dollar maybe because I initiated the call to you. So my function is I, I, got a, I got a dollar's of value. I paid nothing. You paid nothing. The ISP is going to pay a little bit from traffic. So when they go look at their value of the internet, their benefit transactions, which is what you and I pay them monthly for our service charges, gives them cash, and their cost is carrying all that traffic. And we just contributed to their cost structure. So they're absorbing the cost structure, which is a nice thing about this model. It's a universal model, and it's fine-grained, so we can actually use it to decompose the same transaction from multiple views. And then Skype's got a view on that transaction, too. It has zero value to them, except that they got our customer loyalty, and they're going to make money on us, right, when we go to Skype out, when we go make a call outside the network. So one of the nice things about this model is, because we're looking at net value add, not gross transaction volume, we can stack up the value calculations for all the parties. I'm going to come back to Richard's book as an example. So who else, who makes money when Richard buys that book? Okay, Richard saved $10, right? But did, it, did I'm going to say you bought this one from Amazon. Did, did Amazon make money on that book? Yeah, there's advertising impressions. And on average, Amazon's got like net margins, I don't know, 5 or 10%. But let's say 10% on your $16 book. Amazon made a buck 60. Now, who else made money on that book? Well, UPS did, right? Whoever shipped it, they made a quarter. Who else made money? Well, please buy my book, the star or one of my four books I've written, The Starfish and the Spider. I'll get royalties, right? Authors get royalties when you bought that book, typically 15%. So off the face price of the book, 20 bucks, 15%, $3 will go to the authors. Now, using this model, we're able to sum up all those values and get a total economic picture and there's no double counting because we're looking at the net benefit. So when we go back to that fundamental law, we're looking at the net value added to all transactions, to all users. And that's really useful because then we can use set theory, you know, and, and, and do all of our subsets and our analysis of different sectors and analysis. So I think we've explained, oh, the model, the other term in the model, uh, as Vint noticed, because I said, oh, this is kind of a linear model. He goes, oh, there's a, there's a geometric, you know, function in there. What's that? I'm like, well, the 1 plus r raised to the power uh, to t of sub k, that is just a discount factor we use in economics to always value, to discount our cash flows back to the present time. So, because if you save $10 today, that's more value, valuable to you than saving $10 11 months from now or 11 years from now. So we take 1 plus the rate of interest, it's called the discount rate, and raise it to the power of t, and then that's, that decreases the future payments. Yes, question in the back. Noah, can we get the mic to the gentleman here who's got Uzo? Uh, the, uh, the question I have is, uh, do you base off the volume? Go ahead and give him the mic, because then the recording system will get it better. Thank you, sir. Um, my question is based off volume, because you mentioned the royalties to the author. Yeah. Is, are the royalties to the author based off the $26? Or the Typically. $16? Typically, they're off the face price uh, of the book. So if you take that into consideration, does your formula take into volume discounting for those individuals? Because someone, there's $10 that gets lost somewhere based off the, off the base price for right, the right, consumer. Right. So, so, okay, so now you're asking the question about macroeconomics, right? So what we're calculating here is the benefits to different parties and the value of the network. What we're not calculating here is the loss to other networks that are not participating in this, okay? So the $10 that got lost was a local bookstore shutting down. The bricks and mortars going down, okay? Absolutely, so and system-wide, so, but then system-wide, what we'd say is this economic engine of networks is restructuring the economy. So if, let's say the economy is the same level or is growing a little bit, we're all getting more value out of it because we're getting the benefit of a more efficient economy. I'm getting my books cheaper. I'm getting my car cheaper. I'm getting products designed like I want. And then maybe, uh, does that answer your question? Yes, thank Great. you. Great. Uh, over here in the, in the camo hat. Oh, sorry, it's not a camo hat. That's a nice, uh, uh, you know, Scottish pattern. 
exactly what the pattern would be considered. But uh, so the, the example that you gave before, you know, um, saving ten dollars on the book and all of that. Uh, there's one thing that, that I don't think you capture in that, and and that is uh, time savings, right? I save time. I don't have to go to the bookstore, etc. Don't you think it's a little bit of an over oversimplification to leave that out of the equation because that you know, temporality is a big deal here, right? That's in B. Your time is a cost. So in route, we didn't talk about it. So let's go back to the, let's go back to the bookstore trans transaction. I, you know why I buy online? To, sa to save time, right? I can one click. Right. You know, I, I don't price shop because my time's too valuable, right? I mean, it's just I'm too busy. So I don't, you know, it's like I'll pay the extra buck or two bucks to Amazon, whoever it is. But so my time absolutely is a transaction, and, and we just, just add it to the accounting. So what this model does is it's like a fundamental kind of, it's similar to profit and loss, but it's not profit and loss. It's, it's in the broader school of what's called um, <clears throat> uh, benefit value economics, but it's specifically a new model so that we can analyze network problems. Well, what I struggle with is how do you quantize that time oh. in, ter in terms of value, right? Yeah, you know how to do that, right? I mean, how long does it take you to go to the bookstore versus how long does it take you to click online and close your transaction out, right? Which explains like, why I buy books, most books on Amazon and not on eBay. And I love eBay and I buy things on eBay, but I don't like to buy books on eBay because it takes me longer to check out and then to follow up with the seller, you know, and make sure they've got my address, right? So I look at that time, I'd say it probably takes me 15 minutes to execute a book purchase on eBay and follow up, maybe longer if things don't go right. Amazon, done. So would you say that there are two different, um, I, I guess, two different value estimates here? One is time and one is, is dollars and, and different, you know, uh, I guess aspects of it that way, or would you try to pull all that together? Here's, here's, here's what I want to uh, propose for consideration is that we want to account for any and every transaction that has any value here, whether it's a positive value and it's a benefit or it's a cost, okay? So, because um, I get eye strain when I use the computer too much too, so I could factor in eye strain, you know, um, as a negative, maybe as a negative cost. So it, that gets down to the transaction accounting. So, and I want to step through because we're going to do some derivations of the model and, and have more fun. So here's the Greeks for those that want it. And by the way, the value at slash dot added, I had, was a little sloppy with some of my notation. And there was, there was a lot of garbage on slash dot about the model when it got thrown out there. But one guy corrected the notation and I really thank that, that person. And I, I sent him a note on slash dot. Because I was using the same one to n on all my different counters and that's just sloppy. So now, I, now it's one to n, one to m, one to p. Actually it was one to, to o in the middle and then Vince Surf looked at this, he goes, Rod, don't use O, don't use a counter of one to O, because O looks like zero, it's an overloaded term, so make it M, so it's a little neater. So that's a change as of yesterday, I was sitting down with Vint Surf in Stockholm, and he is a mathematician, was going over this with me, because he's very interested, because, you know, he loves networks, it's been his whole life. Um, so that's the, the basic Greeks, that's the fundamental model, uh, and it has, you know, it, it's been tuned up in notation, but hasn't changed. The, the concept was first presented here at Black, Black Hat last August. That's the first time this model was ever rolled out. But there's some other things we're going to bring that are new. This is new, right? We've all talked about the network effect, but I've never seen a mathematical model for it. And I propose that this is actually an explicit mathematical model for the network effect. We're simply going to take the same value of a network, such as the Internet, so the only difference on the left-hand side of this equ the, the, the expression and on the right is n plus 1 on the top. The network effect is present for those networks where the addition of an additional member increases the total value of the network. Okay? Then there's a positive network effect. And there's another expression of this model that I'm thinking about. I'm actually thinking of a subset. And one of you can help me with this mathematically. Here's what I want to express. Another expression of the network effect is a network effect or in a virtuous network cycle, when I, when, if you and I are members of this network, if someone else comes in, that the addition of their presence adds value to all the rest of us. So the presence of n plus one, so I gotta figure out how to do that neatly. Because what I'm saying here is, the network effect is present in networks when n plus one, when an additional user comes to the network, the total value increases. But that still means some person could come in the door here and diminish our value, but their value would be so great that it would still hold the network effect. And I, and I want a cleaner expression. I think I've maybe not expressed that too clearly. But let's go to something new. This is a new slide. Because who's talked about the inverse network effect? Here is the inverse network effect mathematically. The in inverse network effect, the only thing we've changed here is the expression in the middle. 
less than rather than greater. So what we're saying is networks that are growing here, n plus 1, are becoming less valuable than the same networks when they're smaller. Okay? And there's a lot of networks. How many of you play golf? How many people play golf? Okay. How many of you are in a private golf club? All right. So how many members are there in your private golf club, sir? Can we get the mic to him, Noah, if I can ask you so kindly? He's here in the blue shirt. About 500. Okay. So why don't you have 1,000? I mean, if you had 1,000, it'd be cheaper for you, right? You, you, you pay less for your ownership stake, and you have to pay less for your annual dues. Yeah, but then I would have less, start, like, less tea time availability. Bingo. Okay? So that's a great example. In most golf clubs in the world, private clubs have four to 500 members, and the reason is that. The reason is when you go higher, you break the transaction model, right? Because, I mean, are, are you willing to wait two weeks to get your tea time? No. And right. I want to play Saturday at 8. Right. And, and the tea times run, what, every 15 minutes or 20 minutes? What's the cycle? Every 12 minutes. Every 12 minutes. Wow, let's look at that efficiency. 12 minutes, right? <coughs> so you don't want the course trampled, right? And you want to have access to your tea times. So the golf club, your club, but see, you'd probably rather have 500 members than 200, right? Yeah, because then the cost would be too high. Right, so the cost would be too high. So if you're really, really rich, you might say, well, we could, do, we could max out our golf club at 300, 300. But by the way, look at the transit. So what are, what's your name again, sir? Mark. Mark? Yeah. Yeah, so Mark, what are the set of transactions that you're looking for from the golf course? You know, or the set of the golf, so you want the tee time. Mm -hmm. You want the course probably clean and neat, right? Um, you want the 18th hole open, or 19th hole, right? So that set of transactions, we're all, what we're doing as economic agents in our networks is we're trying to optimize the value to us of the set of transactions. And I love the golf course example because we have a positive uh, uh, network effect up to around four to 500 members, and then we have a negative. We're going to step through more. So the inverse network effect, we have to understand it because if you don't understand this in business, you run into Bill Gates. And what did Bill Gates just say that confirmed this model in the last two days? Did Bill Gates say something about Facebook? What did he say? No one, no one saw Bill Gates' comment about Facebook? He said it's a waste of time. And why was it a waste of time? Because, no, yeah, right, because, oh, yes, 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 yes. Now we're in real economics. Uh, right, right, let's, let's go through the layers of this analysis. He said, I'm leaving Facebook because I have too many friends. And it's a waste of time. Too many friends. So his Facebook value, he's in the inverse network effect, right? He's overloaded. He's tired of the messages. You know, when he just had 20 of his buds there and buddettes, you know, he could talk, you know, he could link. He had 50 was okay. Now it's at 5,000, whatever it is. 20,000, it's just annoying, right? He's turned off the email updates. So the Facebook network for him has become less valuable. It's part of what, what I think MySpace has faced, right? MySpace started. It was novel. You just had your friends on it. You know, and then all these you know, people you don't know and freaks are joining in and linking up to you and sending you messages. So understanding the network effect is critical and the inverse network effect. And if we don't understand the inverse network effect, we're going to break our business models, okay? We're going to break the models and we're going to break the, the golf club model. We're going to break the support group model, a lot of them. So that's new. So let's look at these examples. We can use this model to look at a private golf club. Let's look at support groups. Okay? There's a lot of support groups out there for people, whether it's for you know, cancer or an addiction or a, light, a loss of a loved one. There's support groups. Mo how big are most support groups? Has anyone been in a support group that's willing to say it? I've been in a support group. It's called a CEO support group. We supported each other, and we were about 10 or 12 in size. In fact, there's a network with 15,000 CEOs in it worldwide, and the fundamental lowest layer model is our support groups of like 8 to 12 CEOs. Now, why? Why, why 8 to 12? Why not 20? Wouldn't that be better? No. If you go to a support group, you shut the door, you sit in a circle, and what do you do? You're going to have a set of transactions. You have a listening transaction, okay? You have a speaking transaction, you probably want to speak, and you have this like this support transactions, emotional feeling of, oh, it feels great, you know, we've helped, we've helped Sam with his problem, you know, whatever it is. <coughs> support groups break down when they get too big. They lose the trust, they lose the intimacy, and you don't get talk time, right? If there's 10 members, you're talking 10% of the time on average. If there's 20, you're talking 5%. If there's 100, you're talking 1%.
Now, talking 1% is not a lot of fun. So there's a dynamic to the networks of support groups that say the optimal number is around 10. Now, is it important to understand this? You bet it is, because the same applies to our work group and our companies. And our, and, and our, our efforts for security, the same laws are going to come up. And so what we're trying to do is just provide tools. Um, Facebook, we talked about Facebook. I talked about YPO, the CEO network that I'm in. Twitter, okay, who has like over 10,000 Twitter followers here? Over 5,000, over 3,000. Okay, we're not Twitters here, huh? I've got, I've got about 5,000. But look, what does it mean? Well, I don't know what it means. You know, some of those used followers are really good followers, people I want to be in touch with. And I, but I turn on autofollow, right? Because most people do if you're a heavy Twitter user. You turn on autofollow, a lot of people are gonna follow you just to see if you follow them back. And it, just because they, they're trying to you know, blow up their stats. So Twitter, it's really interesting what the value is because most of those people are never watching each other's tweets. Um, and so I'd say it's not too relevant. We talked about the internet, AARP. Now, AARP, is that more valuable with more members or does it become less value when, valuable when it has too many members? What do you think? More, right, the more the better. Because it's a bulk buying, bulk lobbying political power and a buying club, okay? There's no loss on more members. I mean, the marginal cost of running a new member and the membership you know, information and sending them information in the mail four times a year or whatever, that doesn't cost much, the value's high. So that network, you want it to go infinitely, okay? So we can step. Th so we can look at your social networks this way. You can look at your work networks. It gives you an idea. Now let's do the economics of security, right? How many of you work in security or network security? Security conference. So shouldn't be surprised. Most of us are in security. So now we're going to take the model applied to security. So V equals B minus C is the simplified version of Beckstrom's law. Okay. V equals B minus C. Now what we're going to do now is we're going to break out costs, right? We're going to break costs out. We're going to have C prime represent costs, all costs, except security investments, which is SI, and except for losses, which are L. That's right, security investments are a cost. And losses are a cost. And now we've broken them out. Now what do we get to do? Well, we, get, we now have a risk management function. This was the whole thing that led me to figure out the economics of networks, was trying to figure out what the risk management should be for cybersecurity. Here's the answer at the simplest, highest level. We're trying to minimize the total SI plus L. We're trying to minimize the amount we invest in security and the amount of our losses. See, some of you are looking at me a little funny, right? Doesn't feel quite right, because isn't security an asset? I mean, shouldn't security be a benefit? Isn't security a benefit? No, no, no. The transaction of delivering security is a cost. The benefit is the reduction in losses, which is a separate thing. So security itself is not an asset. It is an investment with the goal of reducing losses. More specifically, now we're gonna ch we can start charting out some decisions here on how we're gonna invest our security dollars. So there's something called Pareto, Pareto charts in economics, and that means we try to find the best possible uh, fit for a curve or the best possible candidate. So what we want to look at here is we have a loss function on the vertical axis, so that's security losses. So, and, and, the, and the horizontal X is security investment. So if you put zero in security in your company, how big are your losses going to be? be pretty big, right? you are going to break into your network all the time, steal your IP, maybe steal your money, steal your credit card data. So if you invest nothing in security, your losses are going to be huge. All right? Now, if you make the first key moves in security, what, what are the easiest you know, two or three things companies should do in security? Firewall, antivirus, there you go. Firewalls, antivirus, patch management. Okay, you do those three well, you're gonna get a pretty big benefit, right? A lot of people would say 80% security benefit, okay? Now, the next 20% is harder, right? That's why the curve starts to flatten out. So you get a big, big drop on your first investments, but then your marginal investments get Difficult. Now, what we can do, and I was looking at this from the national perspective of the National Cybersecurity Center, and what I said loosely was, look, here's a way to look at this. The best investment, I, I believe, we can make in, in, in national, in fact, global cybersecurity is improve the Internet protocols, is to follow the advice of the IETF, who has proposed that we put in DNSSEC, a more secure version of the domain name system, which means we're going to lock down... Uh, web addresses with a digital signature 
So if you think you're going to PayPal.com, you're really going to PayPal.com and not some shyster's website in the middle who's gathering your PayPal logon and password to steal your money. So DNSSEC, BGPSEC, Border Gateway Protocol Secure version that's being worked on right now. And I just met one of the, the leaders of that two days ago in Stockholm. What I argued was I said, look, if IETF's right, and that's a lot of pretty brilliant engineers, if they're right that we can make those investments in the protocols, to make the entire system more secure for everybody, that's our best investment, okay? It doesn't cost that much to go tighten up the protocols. This thing was never designed for security. The internet was designed for physical security to avoid nuclear attacks. The protocols were not designed for logical security against electronic attack. So the network is extremely vulnerable. So I argue in the government context and the global context, text, the biggest, the greatest investment we can make is, is the uh, improving the internet protocols. And then we talked about patches here, you know, and virus checkers and firewalls and then intrusion detection systems, IPS, then maybe data loss protection. But so when you're looking at your customer, your clients, or your firm, what you want to get a, a grasp of is you're trying, you should be trying to map out that curve. And I found one corporation that's actually done this in detail, but I can't get them to share it publicly yet. They spent about five million dollars doing this analysis. Without the model, they were doing return on investment analysis, which can give you the key data to help drive mapping this out. Now, so let's talk about protocols again. And I like, you know, I, I like economics. You know, I've always loved working with economics. So whatever that Pareto curve is, let's say it's the world of losses on the internet, by changing the protocols, we actually shift down the entire loss function if the protocols are actually more secure. And I'm not the expert to say that DNSSEC is better than DNS without, but I'm going to trust the guys and gals at IETF that say we need to do that and support that implementation and rollout. If they're right, then the whole loss curve drops down. Then that's where we should be putting our money as society and collectively in industry. Let's look at economics and deterrence for a second. So let's look at the hacker's model. Well, the hacker has the same economic model anybody else has. And then we've blown out the model now. So, that, so if, if I'm a hacker, my value equals the benefit, what I steal and get rewarded for stealing, minus my cost. I have costs of buying the hacks, buying the computers. I have to spend a lot of time to not get caught, not get follow, followed, to obfuscate, use proxies, whatever I'm going to do. I've got costs. Uh, I've got a security investment. I've got to do a lot of things not to get caught myself at what I do. Uh, and, then I got, and then I have losses. What's my loss as a hacker? It's getting caught. <laughs> All right? It's getting caught and thrown in jail. It's like I understand a few years ago, you know, some law enforcement authorities hauled some people off in handcuffs from DEF CON, the event that happens this Friday. Okay? Those people had a loss. And their perception of that loss is important, okay? which is why I've always advocated stronger investments in law enforcement. And in the, United, in the U.S. context, that's FBI and Secret Service that do a very good work in, in cyber. And internationally, there's groups in other countries all over the world, and I think it's very important. So, we ha so this economic model can now be used to at least think about deterrence with hackers. All right, in quick review, um, so we, I said, you know, if we're going to look at economics of networks, we should be able to look at what's the value of a network to individuals. Did we answer that? Richard, we figured it out more or less, Richard, right? We looked at your books, looked at all your transactions, figured that out. Then we scaled from him to the total network, right? So now we have an economic model for looking at complete networks, whether that's your social network, whether it's your golf club, or whatever it might be. We looked at security economics, security risk uh, uh, management, hacker economics, and economics of deterrence. So anyway, it's a whole range of problems you can, you can answer. Um, some of the benefits of this model, or law, is very simple. It is granular scalable, subsetable. It's important that set theory be present here, or we can't do really interesting you know, community-based analysis. Um, it's accurate, as accurate as your data. It's very similar to P&L concepts, and that's a good thing, because it means we can use accountants and others to help analyze this and do cost accounting. Leverage is traditional cost accounting techniques. Um, it's testable. We can test this model. And it's as simple as it can be. That is a darn simple model if you look at it, but it can't be made any simpler. It cannot be reduced further. We can expand it with more analysis of time cost, transaction cost. It's as simple as it can be, but no simpler, which was, was Einstein's criteria or, or criterion for any model. And it's a foundation for derivative models. We looked at taking the model and applying it into security. You can do other things. So here's the downside. Here's the problem with the model. 
You've got to get the data. If you don't have the data, you can't value a network. But at least it focuses on us on the right data. And that is the transaction data from the standpoint of the user. Yes, sir. And Noah, can we get the mic here to the gentleman, please? Maybe you've got another downside. There may be other downsides, and please feel free to contribute them. This is all concepts under development. Uh, so when you talk about subsets, that brings something else to mind in, in my head here. Um, Chinese information warfare theory favors logical attacks and whatnot because they're based upon the concept that the network increases exponentially with n, you know, the, the old model. Yeah. So un obviously this makes more sense, but different networks are going to have different values because of the transactions. So you're going to have different subsets. Um, and again, there's the challenge. You have to get the data as well. So um, <coughs> try to say this as obliquely as possible. If I want to get an idea of which subset of a network I would get the greatest impact from an attack. Look at the transactions. I'm going to look at where's the data that I want to have, where's the valuable transaction I can come home, bring to head office, and they give me a high five and celebrate. Give me a new BMW or get me, you know, whatever it is that I'm going to get as a hacker as a reward. Okay? So, so it's all about, it's about the data value there. And it, so, so, you know, where are you going to send your best hackers if you're doing state actions? Where are you going to send it the most valuable data? You're not going to hit Department of Agriculture. You're going to go after, you know, a defense department or an so, economic ministry. So in a sense, there's almost a value to, there's almost like a, a, an anti-value to a network from that perspective. Perhaps. And, yeah. we can, and we can talk that through. So thank you for bringing that up. I'm going to roll through this just to, to meet the time effort. So the key thing to take away from today is, it's not about N, right? It's not about the number of nodes in a network or the number of devices. It's all about the transactions and focusing on the transaction. And however, whatever your problem set is, if you want to bring in the economic dimension, focus on the transactions and figuring out what are the key ones you want to value and how. We've had our questions. That's it. So I thank you very much. This is my email, rod.beckstrom at ican.org. And I want to give a hand to the whole crowd and everyone who asked questions and participated and contributed to the thinking. So thank you very much.